What I'm about to say might disappoint a lot of kids and some adults too. There is no such thing as real magic. No one's making things disappear and reappear. No one's making things go through walls. No laws of nature are being broken. It's all sleight of hand and optical illusions. However, there is a realm where if it were possible for us to view directly, we would swear that we were witnessing real magic where our everyday physics and sense of reality would appear to be completely violated. I'm talking about the quantum world, where a different set of physical laws seem to make things behave in ways that we can't fathom, like objects going through walls or appearing and disappearing constantly. We're gonna do something that I've wanted to do for a long time. We're going to project the behavior of quantum objects onto the macro scale. If our everyday objects like tables, chairs, and tennis balls behave like quantum objects such as electrons and atoms, what would we see? Now, here's a little secret that's not widely known. The quantum world does not operate with a different set of laws. The very same laws apply to everything. We just can't see the weird behavior at our scales. Why is that? I'll tell you the answer to that, but first let's look at the fascinating visualization of quantum mechanics projected onto everyday objects coming up right now. Before we go further, I wanna give a big shout out to Magellan TV, our sponsor. If you're curious about where I get my inspiration from many of the subjects I talk about, there's a little hidden jewel that I usually refer to. It's Magellan TV, the highest rated documentary streaming app on Google Play. One documentary that really got me thinking recently is called Virtual Universe. It shows how computer simulations can accurately predict how galaxies interact and reveal how they're shaped by dark matter even though we can't see it. Magellan has the largest collection of space and science shows anywhere and they add more than 20 hours of new content weekly. They're all about the drama of real life like revelations about the planet Venus and new discoveries by the James Webb Telescope. Magellan has a special offer right now for our Vinash viewers. Your first month is free, 4K videos are included, and there are never any ads. Magellan makes an especially great gift this holiday season. It's a great value that your loved ones can enjoy all year long, so be sure to click the link in the description, and you'll be supporting this channel when you do, so I really appreciate that. Now, back to the show. Let's say you're alone in a classroom that seats 10 students. When a second student enters the room, you appear to be seated in all the seats at once. This student doesn't know where you are, but as soon as he sits or touches one of the chairs to see if it's empty, you appear in one of the seats sitting by yourself, and he is then able to take a seat. You are in what's called a superposition, which is the ability of a quantum object such as a photon, electron, atom, or anything sufficiently isolated to be in multiple positions at the same time until it is measured. This principle comes from the Schrodinger equation, which contains a term called the wave function. The wave function for an object contains all the information that describes the quantum objects, such as its position, spin, momentum, etc. In quantum mechanics, objects are in a state of superposition where they can take on all possible states prior to measurement. Once a measurement is made, however, the properties of the particle gets fixed to only one of the states. Note that a measurement does not mean a physical measurement made by a human or any conscious observer. A measurement is any kind of interaction, and it's a physical or mechanical process that does not require a measurer of any kind. In the case of you sitting in the classroom, the interaction occurred when the second student tried to sit in one of the chairs. You were in superposition before the interaction, but no longer after the interaction. Another key aspect of quantum mechanics is the departure from the deterministic classical world to a more probabilistic world. What do I mean by that? Let's say you're playing squash, hitting the ball against the wall in front of you. And as your partner expects the ball to bounce back to him so he can hit it, no ball comes. The ball has disappeared. Behind the wall is a second squash court, and the players in that court find that they are playing with two balls. Your ball went through the wall somehow. You look for holes in the wall, but find none. What happened here? This phenomenon is known as quantum tunneling. In quantum mechanics, when a quantum object like an electron encounters an energy barrier, like a wall, there is a non-zero chance that will end up on the other side of the wall. 
This is possible because you have to remember that quantum objects are defined by a wave function, and the wave function extends to all of space-time. This means that it extends not only in your court, but also into the wall and outside the wall into the other court. And the smaller the energy barrier, that is the thinner and lower the wall, the greater the probability that it will end up on the other side. Your squash court front wall was probably very thin. The ball, if it is a quantum object, did not go through any hole, but simply went through the wall and ended up on the other side. All this is presuming any player can hit the squash ball in the first place. If the squash ball is a quantum object, it is subject to something called the uncertainty principle. This is a principle introduced by one of the founders of quantum mechanics, Werner Heisenberg. It basically says that there's a fundamental limit to how precisely we can know certain combinations of properties of a particle. The most common pair of properties with such a limit is position and momentum. This means that the more precisely we know how fast the squash ball is moving, the less precisely we know where it is. We can illustrate why this is the case with a simple analogy. Picture a rope attached to a wall with a person on the other end waving it. If he waves his hand several times, multiple waves will form on the rope. This is analogous to the waveform of a quantum object. If we look at a snapshot of these waves, we will see that it is fairly easy to determine the wavelength of this wave. However, the position of the wave is not distinct. The position could be anywhere. On the other hand, if the person waves his hand only once, a single wave will travel from one end to the other. In this case, the position of the wave is fairly easy to determine, but now we don't know what the wavelength is. So with this analogy, we can either know the wavelength or position fairly precisely, but not both. Note that I'm using the term wavelength interchangeably with momentum here because there's a direct relationship between the two via this equation, where lambda is the wavelength and P is the momentum, and H is Planck's constant. This uncertainty of not being able to precisely know the wavelength and position of the rope simultaneously is analogous to the uncertainty in position and momentum of quantum objects. And you should know that this is not due to an observer effect. In other words, it's not a limitation of what we can measure. It is a limitation of what we can know. It's inherent in the properties of wave-like objects. So given this, it would be very hard for either player to hit the ball because if he could see very clearly where the ball is, he wouldn't know how fast it's going. So he might swing before it gets to his racket. On the other hand, if he knew how fast it was going, he would have no idea where it is. Now, let's keep going with the squash ball visualization. Suppose there's a squash ball machine that creates and shoots squash balls onto the wall for practice purposes. Remember, our imaginary squash ball is a quantum object. If you were in the court, you would not actually see any balls coming out of the ball machine. All you would see is balls bouncing off the wall in front of you. It would be as if the balls are coming out of the wall. But what's really happening is that the balls coming out of the ball machine are in superposition. They only become localized and visible to you after they have interacted with the wall in front of you. Before this happens, their location could be anywhere in the court. The various locations would have a probability associated with them. They could even be outside the court due to quantum tunneling I described previously. But if we make the walls of the court thick enough and high enough, the ball is likely to be confined to within the court. Now suppose there happens to be two slits on the wall. If the balls coming out of the machine are now fired towards the slits, you would not see them at all. Some might bounce off the wall adjacent to the slits, but most would simply go through the slits, remaining in superposition onto the court next to yours. If you went to the adjacent court, however, you would see the balls bounce off the wall on the next court. The interesting thing is that if you could see the scuff marks on the wall of the adjacent court after the machine throws many hundreds of balls towards the slits, you would see that the scuff marks make a distinct interference pattern, as if multiple waves were hitting the wall. This illustrates the famous double slit experiment, which is done typically with photons and electrons, but can be done with any quantum particle. So these illustrations beg the question, why don't we actually see this in our everyday experience? Why don't these quantum behaviors appear in our macro world? Do the laws of quantum mechanics apply only to micro objects? The answer is no. The laws of quantum mechanics do not change. They apply to everything, including the squash ball. But the effects of quantum mechanics 
are too small to be noticed. So why is the effect more obvious at atomic scales, but not noticeable at our everyday macro scales? Subatomic and atomic scale objects act like waves, and so behave like quantum objects. But large objects are made of a huge number of atoms. For example, a squash ball is made of almost 10 to the 15, or one quadrillion atoms, each of which are wave-like quantum objects. But the problem is that all these innumerable atoms act in a disorganized and random manner. Their individual waves interfere with each other and average out to zero on the macroscopic scale. This disorganized wave-like behavior is called decoherence in physics. In order to get a macro object like a squash ball to behave like a quantum object, we would need all its quadrillions of individual waves to be coherent. In other words, we would need to get them to behave in an organized way. The more coherent an object, the more it acts like a wave and thus a quantum object. This is next to impossible to do for this and other large scale objects. Although this is not feasible for something like a squash ball, you should know that coherence has been achieved in some large molecules consisting of several thousand atoms. So for example, molecules consisting of 2,000 coherent atoms have been used in the double slit experiment and demonstrated to have wave-like or quantum mechanical behavior, just as I showed in my example. In addition, there are several real-world examples of macro objects displaying quantum mechanical behavior. One example is superconductors, where at very low temperatures, large groups of electron pairs act in unison to form what's called a Bose-Einstein condensate, which acts like a quantum object. I made a video of this if you want to know more details. Quantum behavior in superconductors can be very large, up to kilometer-sized in superconducting wires. Other examples are superfluids, where at very low temperatures, a fluid flows with no loss of kinetic energy. Another interesting example you might be familiar with can be seen in this photograph. You'll notice that you can see this person's fingerprints on the inside of the glass. This should actually not happen because the photons at the glass-air interface are all totally reflected back towards the water, making a mirror-like surface. The reason you can still see the fingerprint ridges is due to quantum tunneling. This phenomenon is called FTIR, or Frustrated Total Internal Reflection. I have a reference link in the description if you want to know more details on this. Now, the main takeaways I want you to get out of this video are that quantum mechanics is really everywhere, and everything at its core is really a wave. This wave-like behavior is all around you, but you would not be aware of it. If you could shrink yourself to quantum scales or project quantum behavior to your macro scales, like the animations I showed, the world would look completely different. But that's the real world we live in, and is the way the universe actually operates. If you enjoyed this video, then help us out by subscribing and giving us a thumbs up. If you have a question, please leave it in the comment section. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.